All right, Philippians chapter number three. Um, let's look at verse two. Paul is giving the warning again, and uh, last time, the last few sessions, we were looking at this issue of uh, beware of dogs. Those are the lost Gentiles. Uh, dogs have to do with their ravenous ways uh, to destroy the, uh, the saints of God, the things of God. He says, beware of evil workers. We saw that the evil workers have to do with those who are in the body of Christ, and, 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 but they reject the, the, the truth of God's word uh, rightly divided in this day. In, in Paul's day, they rejected Paul's uh, revelation of the mystery. Ron, I wrote lost Jews. Am I wrong? You said the, lost the lost Gentiles. Jews are the concision, what we're going to see tonight. Oh, you said oh, lost Gentiles. Yeah. yeah. The, the, dogs the, the, the dogs are the Gentiles. The what? The dogs are the Gentiles. That's, right. Okay. But the concision is the lost Gentiles. Jews. Jews, right. That, we're going to see that tonight. We're going to see some more about that tonight. So, Thank you. In, in the verse, he, so three three categories of people there. Beware of dogs, so right. lost Gentiles. Beware of evil workers. Those are saved people who are who are working against evil brethren of the body of Christ who work against the truth of God's rightly divided word, particularly through Paul. And then Paul in his day, in the Philippians, in their day, also had, there was another group of people there and now, this is something that we probably don't have to beware of today, um, I guess unless you're around, you know, Jewish people. But in Paul's day, because the, the Jewish people, and he was in the Middle East, he had to beware of what he calls the concision. Now, that issue of concision, it's weird because the word concision means the ones who are just cut off, right? It has a dual meaning. Uh, concision simply means cutting, right? So, concision. It means con is with, scission is to cut, okay, or cutting. And basically, it's it's a it's a term of derision um, by God and Paul to the to the to the lost Jews. And they the Jews had a had an had an ordinance, um, not just in the law, but from Abraham's day. Let's look. We're going to look at that. But it's called circumcision. Circumcision, right? Mm -hmm. And that circumcision was a covenant that God made with. The Hebrew people. But by the time we come to the dispensation of grace, God is not dealing with people based upon a physical circumcision. So this concision are those are those lost Jews who have a physical circumcision of their foreskin of their flesh. The, the males especially. Physical, physical cutting. And what Paul is saying is, basically he's saying, beware of the concision. Beware of these guys trying to put you back under the law of Moses and the Jewish program. He says, yes, they have the physical circumcision based upon what we're going to see in the Old Testament, but that's not what God's doing today. God is not dealing with circumcision. It availeth nothing today. Uncircumcision availeth nothing, but the truth of God's word. So let's look at that. The issue of concision are those lost Jews who reject Christ. They reject Paul's preaching of Christ according to Revelation mystery. Anything that's not uh, related to the law of Moses. That's the point in that day. Okay. Um, how that will relate today is lost religious people, okay? People who have a religious system, but they're, it, it, it has nothing to do with Christ, okay? Other religions that have nothing to do with Christ, they would fit the concision today. They're just religious, but they reject Christ. Well, that's what the lost Jews did. Now, the issue of circumcision, let's go look at it, where it came from. Go all the way back to the book of Genesis. Genesis is the book of beginnings, right? It's the Genesis. Uh, you see the word gene in there. Where did the human race come from? Where did genetics come from? It came from Adam, God's creation of Adam. But where did the Hebrew people, the Jews, come from? They came from Abraham, okay? And we'll see more about that. Uh, God loved Abraham because of Abraham's faith. And Abraham believed God. And because of that, God makes a covenant, a pact, a contract with Abraham to bless him. In fact, so you can see that. Go to Genesis chapter 12. Let's go to Genesis chapter 12. Let's start there. Uh, some people may not be familiar with why Abraham is so um, is so so uh, well known in Scripture and and, and beyond Scripture. Um, do you know today the the most respected man on earth today today is Abraham? Abraham is the father. Is considered by three major religions. Okay, uh, obviously the, the uh, Judaism, the, you know, Judaism, Judaism. Okay, Abraham, 
they consider Abraham their spiritual father. You know, he, he's, he began the Jewish, you know, when I say Jewish people, the Hebrew people, and then later the Jews under the law. But Islam. Islam. Uh, Islam yeah. Okay. Right. Islam. Ishmael. Through Ishmael, right. Abraham's um, son, mm -hmm. actually his first son, right. but not, he's, he's the illegitimate, illegitimate one, not right. the one God counted for promise. But Abraham's firstborn son was a man, a boy or a man now named uh, Ishmael, and it was through Hagar, the, the, the uh, Egyptian Hand. handmaid of Sarah. But then, we now, so you got Judaism and Islam, but then, I'm going to say it like this, uh, Christianity, you know, just how the world know. Christianity, they, they attribute their start, obviously, through Christ, but Christ goes back to Abraham, right? Abraham. So... Wasn't it his faith? Abraham's faith, and we're going to see that, okay? Yeah. So these three religions, and I call it that Christendom, Islam, and Judaism, today they all respect and revere Abraham. And all, you, if you're a, if you're in Judaism, great respect for Father Abraham. Islam, great respect for Father Abraham. He was he was Ur of the Chaldees. He was of he was from that 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 territory of, of Babylon and so forth. Okay, originally. Gentile too. Yeah, 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 he was a Gentile. We're going to see that in Romans. And then obviously Christendom. Um, so the most respected man on planet Earth today and has been from his day has been Abraham. Now I say now because the most respected person on Earth should be the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Uh, they reject him. Judaism does. Right. Islam, that's another Jesus, Isa, and they don't, they, 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 they don't even uh, account that he died on the cross. And most of Christendom, interesting enough, rejects Jesus Christ according to Revelation of Mystery, right? right. The, the, the truth of Christ how, as Paul preaches. So one day the Lord Jesus Christ will be the most respected human being because he's the man Christ Jesus. Um, but one thing about the Lord Jesus Christ today, uh, Chris and I coming up um, Fair Oaks Boulevard as, as it turns right there in Manzanita, there's a big blue sign with letters that says, Who is Jesus? Jesus Christ is the most probably well-known person in human history. Now, that's a difference. You can be well-known and hated like our Lord, or you can be well-known and loved like Abraham. He's the most well-known person on planet Earth is the Lord Jesus Christ. People have all types of ideas about who he is. Now, let's look at Abraham. Jesus Christ is the son of Abraham, it says in his genealogy. Son of David, son of Abraham in Matthew. By the way, he says the son of David, because <clears throat> he's going to be the king, and the son of, of Abraham because of the, the promised seed, okay? The seed, your seed. We'll look at that in a moment. Um, the seed is going to uh, inherit the earth. Look at Genesis chapter 12 and verse number 1. Now the Lord had said, so this is previous there in chapter 11, had said unto Abram, now Abram is Abraham's name before God changed it. Abram means exalted father, Abraham means father of many nations. Verse 1, now the Lord had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country, Ur the Chaldees, and from thy kindred, okay, all those people back there, and from thy father's house, even leave your, your father and, and, and your, it, they, they were his tribe and all that behind, idol worshippers, <clears throat> unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make, now everybody watch this, I will make of thee, you Abraham, a great nation. That nation is going to turn out to be the nation of Israel. And I will bless thee, and, and I will make thy name great. Again, God is, has done that. He's, he has a nation of Israel in history. He blessed Abraham. Abraham was rich in silver, in cattle, and in gold. I remember a preacher, a health, wealth, prosperity preacher years ago, even before I I uh, knew right division. He would use that verse. He <laughs> said, right? Abraham was rich in silver and cattle and gold. Basically, he was saying, if you give to his ministry, right. he'll, he, you know, <laughs> he don't, he don't, he don't use the verses in the Gospels where the Lord says how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom, sell all and all that. No, it's these. But he did that. God blessed him. He made his name great. What did I show you? The most well-respected man, the greatness of Abraham is known throughout the world. And thou shalt be a blessing. Abraham himself and his seed. Well, look, look. Ab by the way, Abraham was a blessing. Through him, anyone around him would be blessed of the Lord. Because he, because the Lord was with him. Verse 3. And I will bless them that bless thee. And curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And so that's what's called the Abrahamic covenant. Okay? 
But God extends that covenant and gives them a sign of it called circumcision. Let's go to chapter 17. Go over to Genesis chapter 17. So here's, here's the, uh, the, the sign of, of, of the covenant that God made with Abraham. Notice in chapter 17 of Genesis, let's read verse 5 on down. <clears throat> no, you start at verse 1, we'll get to see it. And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am almighty God, walk before me, be thou perfect. I always want to share this with you guys. Notice verse 1 says how old Abraham was. He was 99 years old. But if you look at, look at the verse preceding 17 verse 1, look at 16 verse 16, because there's, God's going to give his age here. Notice in verse 16, and Abram was four score and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abraham. Now, my wife was the math, the mathematician in the family, and, 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 I, and we, we've already noticed that Jada Landis, she's homeschooled. She loves to read more like me, and, and, and she's a good reader. She, math, she doesn't like as much, so she kind of take after me with that. But I can do this math. In Genesis chapter number 16, 16, Abraham fourscore, I know from President, um, what's, what's, the, what's the president, uh, Lincoln, fourscore and seven years ago, remember that? He was talking about what, what the forefathers did from his time. Fourscore and seven years ago, 87 years. So four, a score is 20 years. So Four score is 80 years. And then you add a six. So Abraham, when he gave when 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 she gave birth to Ishmael, let me get my uh let me get my uh black marker here. When it, when uh, Hagar gave birth to Ishmael, Abraham was 86 years old. Last verse of chapter 16. Look at the next verse, verse chapter 17, verse 1. And when Abram was how old? 90 years old and nine. So that's 99. So this is gonna be easy math for me. Three, one. From one verse to the other, God didn't talk to Abraham for 13 years. And 13 in the Bible is the number of rebellion. Hmm. Yeah. It says over in Genesis chapter number 14, in the 13th year, they rebelled. All through scripture, Dorothy, 13 is associated with rebellion. So, by the way, if you have a child named Mary or Maria or Miriam or anything like that, the name Mary equals rebellion. So let me tell you, if you have a daughter named Mary, when she turned 13 years old, you're in trouble. Okay? Yeah. Any Marias? I'm going to ask Maria, and, 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 uh, how was she at 13? Her mother probably said rebellious. Because both of those were rebellious. And they, they're tied to the nation. But the, here's the point. Because of having Ishmael with Hagar, because he rebelled against God's truth, God didn't, according to the scriptures, God was silent. For 13 years. Wow. Yeah. That was huge. But then, and here's what God was doing too, Dorothy. Abraham was still able in, in 85, 86 years to, to produce a, uh, how do I want to say, a seed, right? Right. He could, he, his body wasn't dead yet. Right. But when, we're going to see when we get to uh, Romans, right. at 99, his body was dead. Right. He couldn't produce seed anymore. God wanted Abraham to get to the point, and his wife, by the way, Sarah, right. to get to the point where there was no way they could have a child but by a miracle of God. Right. So that's what he says here. Look at chapter 17, verse 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make a covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of, now notice, many nations. By the way, that's what Abraham means. Verse 5, neither, well, there it is. Neither shall thy name anymore be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful. Now, can I tell you, can I, a 90 year, 99 year old man is sitting there listening to the Lord. And he's like, man, I'm close to death. And you're talking about all these seeds I'm going to have. But watch this. Verse 6, I will make, because it's going to be God, I will make the exceeding fruitful. I will make nations. Now, Dorothy, you mentioned earlier, he said nations, right? I, I, I erased it, but all those Islamic nations, right. all those nations around the Hebrew people, they're all from Abraham too. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Um, look at this. 
I, I will make, um, where am I now? Exceeding six. Six. And I will make the exceeding fruitful and will make nations of thee and kings, plural, shall come out of thee. That's true. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger. Now, here's the land, all the land of Canaan. And if you look on a map today, it's not that little bitty strip, the Sinai Peninsula. That It's the Arabian Peninsula, where Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Yemen on the south. It's that entire Arabian Peninsula, okay? And eventually, Abraham's going to have it. Interesting enough, his children do live on that area. Okay, so, 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 so that is interesting. But here's the point. God promised Abraham the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now, if anybody knows, what, why is ISIS doing what they're doing? They're trying to claim the land for Islam. And in essence, they think that the promise that God gave for that land over there is not through Abraham's son Isaac, right. but through Abraham's son who? Ishmael. Ishmael. And that's what the battle is over there in the Middle East. They're fighting over that land, and it all goes back to Abraham. Let's keep looking. So that's like brothers against brothers. Brothers against brothers. Brothers, cousins, it's family. Okay, verse 9. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generation. Now, here's what they have to keep. Okay, here we go. Verse, verse number 10. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be what? Circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. By the way, why that's happened is because where do you produce seed as a man? Where did the seed come to be into the womb? Through, the, through, through that, through that the, the member, right? So he cut it. And what that represents, circumcision means cutting. Circum. Uh, uh, circumference. I'm going to throw this one away. Circumference. What's the circumference of a circle? They talk about it's, it. It comes around, right? Cir circum. Circle. It, it means circle. And what you do, you cut around. And what, what you were cutting off, that little child was the foreskin of his flesh, what he could produce. It represents cutting off. So you cut off what the flesh produces. Now, interesting. That's what it's a picture of. So every time they did that, they were reminding themselves and their little sons that you're going to have children, but it's based upon the covenant God made with us. It's not you. It's them. So, by the way, I, I, as a man, like, no man would think about that. No man would think of putting a knife down there, okay, cutting anything. <laughs> so you know it's from God. Right. You know it's from God. And that's why God did it. I was thinking no Gentile heathens would ever do that. They think Abraham was nuts to go down and cut him. And, and God knew it was something that the heathens wouldn't even try. They were like, this guy's nuts. But you know what? It was, it was representative of cutting off what the flesh can produce. And that go right on around, circumcision, to cut around. Now, by the time we get to the days of Paul, and, 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 and we get to the dispensation of grace, that circumcision covenant is not in effect. That's why God and Paul tells people to, not to do that. Now let's look at verse 11. Will it be in the, in the uh, preparation? Yes. Time? Yes. The oh, only okay. time it's not in effect is the dispensation of grace. Right. Everything, when, when the Lord comes and ends his dispensation at the rapture, it will pick up, it will pick up right where it was before. Yep, everything. Yeah. Uh, look, at, look at verse 11. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man, child in your generation, he is born in the house, and so forth. Now, can I tell you guys this? Now, we do it, you know, we do it to our male children in our culture. But it's not a religious thing. It's just a custom. And But there are some, there's some health benefits to the young boy as well right. by doing that. So, God didn't just have them do that just symbolically. It was some wisdom behind it for their health, too. The, day, the days make a difference, too. The days make a huge difference. Yeah. Exactly. That eight days, that, that some, it's some, it's some. Uh, he now has the ability to have his healing process. Yeah. To, all those things. It's it's a wonderful, wonderful yeah, it's, thing. It's Verse thirteen. Okay. 
He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Wow. Now what's interesting there, guys, it seems weird because why wouldn't Coming out the womb, an eight-day-year-old boy can't circumcise himself. So what God is doing, he's putting the onus on the father. You see that? You, it's your responsibility to make sure your son is part of this covenant. It's interesting that God is putting that, 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 that huge responsibility. But that's what God wants. So anyway, there, there's the covenant of circumcision. Um, by the way, notice in verse 24. Notice in verse 24, and Abraham was 90 years old and nine when he, he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. I know, yeah. But, but watch this, Dorothy. A lot of people don't know this from Scripture. Look at verse 25. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the foreskin of his flesh. Because most people think it's just a Jewish thing, but no, no, no. Ishmael did it too, okay? When I say Ishmael, Ishmael was circumcised by Abraham. It was his son. The, because he was under Abraham. Under, exactly. And, and God did bless Ishmael. If everybody remember, when Hagar was put out and so forth, yes. God came to her and said, look, I'm going to bless your son. But it wasn't a covenant. It wasn't a covenant. It was just the mercy of grace of God. That's right. right. In the selfsame day was Abraham circumcised, and Ishmael his son, verse 27, and all the men of his house, born in the house, and bought with money of the stranger. So anybody, any, any guys who came under Abraham's house were circumcised. If you were part of, Abraham had very and much riches. He, he, he had like a, a, a whole company of people. If you were a male and you were associated with Abraham, you got circumcised, okay? Now let's go over to Deuteronomy. Go over to Deuteronomy chapter number 10. Uh, you got Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Leviticus, Numbers, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Leviticus, I forgot, Leviticus. Uh, and then Numbers and Deuteronomy. Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 10. It's the fifth book of Moses of the Bible. When you hear people talk about the Pentateuch, Penta is five, they're talking about uh, Genesis through De Deuteronomy. The Torah is the entirety and so forth. Look at Deuteronomy 10, verse 16. All right. Oh, oh, oh. And if everybody remember what Deuteronomy is about? Deuter Deuteronomy means a second giving of the law. When God brought them out in Exodus, how many years about did it take for them to actually go into the land? About 40 years, right? So the little ones, all the children who were, came out in the original Exodus, they're now grown men or grown people. So God has to give them the law again before Moses died. So Deuteronomy is a second given of the law. That's why a lot of things written earlier are repeated in Deuteronomy. Now watch what he says here. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter number 10, verse number 16. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your, now watch this, heart, and be no more stiff-necked. Now why did God say that? Because what happens is, look at verse 15. Only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you, 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 you Hebrews, above all people. Remember when I said it's the cutting off of the flesh. But notice... What else has to do with circumcision? He's talking about the foreskin of your heart. heart. So what happens is, remember I told you, God uses physical examples to show a spiritual right, reality. Every time they did that physical circumcision, it was to remind them that they need to cut off that that. that uh, the circumcision of their heart. Notice it says, and not be stiff-necked. Another word for stiff-necked is this. Pride. Pride. Yes. Prideful. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't be that. And every time you thought of circumcision, it was to be of your heart. So really, what Paul's going to tell us too, that what circumcision represents is a cutting off of the flesh and pride. Now that's something that we do need today. It Just like it's not right to tell people we're, it's we shouldn't tell people we don't need to be baptized. We need to tell people we don't need to be water baptized. Okay? I got a, I got a, I got a call just today from a guy. I think he's somewhere on the East Coast. 
and he was, he was watching one of our YouTube videos that I did on baptism. And I could tell he's a Pentecostal or something because he was like, what about Acts 238 and this and that? And so I'm, I tried calling him back. He, was, he gave his work number. He was already gone. So I'm going to call him tomorrow or whatever. And what he doesn't realize is that water baptism was a picture, a physical picture of a spiritual baptism, right? Today, we need to tell people, yes, we need to be baptized, but it's not water. We need to be baptized by one spirit into one body, right? 1 Corinthians 12, 13. But it's also not right to tell people that circumcision is not a requirement. We need to tell them the physical circumcision is not a requirement, but there is one of the heart. And God did perform a circumcision on us, we're going to see in Colossians, so stay tuned to that, okay? All right, let's keep going. So God tells Israel, after 40 years of being stiff-necked, be no more stiff-necked. Now, where would you guys, you remember where you heard the word stiff-necked again? In Acts chapter 7, when Stephen was stoned, Let's, let's look at that. Go to Acts. Before we do, um, we're, in, we're in Deuteronomy. We'll, we'll get to Acts. Go to Deuteronomy 30. Go to 30, chapter 30. Remind me uh, there, about stiff neck. Because that's the exact indictment that Stephen, a man filled with the Holy Ghost, a prophet of God, is going to indict the nation of Israel right before God changes the program. God says, don't be stiff neck. Circumcise your heart. Israel refused to, but they still kept doing a physical circumcision for some reason, because all they care about is the flesh, wow. and the law, and so forth. Yeah, and, and in their mind, it, it goes all the way back to Abraham, even pre-law, 400 years. But anyway, you, like you said, Dorothy, they're just focusing on the outward, the flesh. Right. And God kept saying, listen, it's the spirit. Yes, do that, but remember, it's a cutting off of, of your flesh, your pride, right? The stiff neck. But we'll look at that. Look at Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. Now, here's the beautiful thing. As God ends his plan and purpose through Moses, Moses is about to die soon. He gives them one more reminder of his loving kindness. Look at this. Oh, you know what? Let's get the context. Start at verse 30, uh, chapter 30, verse 1. And it shall come to pass. God is going to give them prophecy about their nation. Watch this. I love this. And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the what? The curse. So now they're under the law. Oh, man. You guys have to understand. Remind me, Chris, about the law was added, okay? No. Yeah, the law was added. Law added. We're gonna, this is going to be a good study because, ooh, this is going to be good. God was dealing with Israel the Hebrew people, everybody, under the Abrahamic covenant. 400 years. Then they decided to receive the law, a performance-based acceptance. Mm -hmm. God was dealing with them graciously already, and they decided, oh, we'll take some punishment too. You know, we can do it. It was ridiculous. It was crazy. <laughs> so Moses was basically going to tell them before he dies, you guys are going to go and, and get in trouble. God's going to bless you here. He's going to curse you there. Let's keep looking at it. Chapter 30, verse 1. And it shall come to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before thee, that's the law, and thou shalt, oh, my, this is so good, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations which the Lord thy God hath driven thee. You see that? He already tell them, y'all going to mess it up, and according to Leviticus 26, you're going to be scattered amongst the nation, right? While they're out there looking around going, why are we in our land? Oh, we broke the covenant. Here we go. Verse 2, and, and shall return unto the Lord thy God, and shall obey, obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thy heart and with all thy soul. What's the issue? It's the inner man. Is that prophetic? Yeah, because guess what the Lord Jesus said when he came, Dorothy? When the people say, what shall we do? He says, thou shalt love the Lord with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind and strength, and your neighbor is yourself. That's what the law is about. Right. Okay. Verse number three. When they do all that, verse three, and then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity. And, and where is that in? That's, that's in when, the, when they go through the tribulation period, the time of Jacob's trouble, and the Lord Jesus comes back. Right. Okay? Right. It's future. So that's really a long time. Ooh, a long time. Prophesied. Yeah. And have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all nations, whither the Lord thy God has scattered thee. Mm. 
By the way, that's going to be officially the Feast of Trumpets of that year the Lord returns. He's going to gather all the, cap the, the people. The Lord has scattered thee. The Lord's, oh yeah, it was the Lord. Because they covenanted with him, Dorothy. They said, okay, God, if we disobey you, you put us out there. What did Daniel say when he was in Babylon? After 70 years, he's looking around. He goes, I think Jeremiah, he says this, Jeremiah says that in about 70 years, it's time. And when Daniel confesses to the Lord his sins and the sins of his people, he says something like, Lord, I know. Remind me, let's, we have fun tonight. Daniel. Daniel's prayer. And what I want you guys to see, Daniel says in his prayer, Lord, you did this righteously because we covenant with you. Okay, so remind me to show you that. Let's keep going here. So it's going to be, if the Lord thy God is going to be, verse 4. If any of thine be driven out unto the uttermost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. Now, Dorothy, watch this. Just the same way the Lord scattered them, watch what he's going to do in the kingdom. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thy heart. And the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thine soul, that thou mayest live. You know what that is? That's the new covenant. In Jeremiah 31, well, you know what? We, we can look at all of them. Go to get, get Jeremiah 4 and Jeremiah 31. Go over to Jeremiah, one of the, uh, the prophets near Isaiah and so forth. If you find Isaiah, yeah, Jeremiah. then Jeremiah. Get Jeremiah chapter 4. And then we'll look at Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah chapter 4, and Jeremiah 31. Man, all, these, these are all my favorites here. Look at Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 4. Jeremiah 4, 4. Start at verse 3. Um, if you see a little mark by verse 3, you should see a 3. And, and that little mark, that's a paragraph marker. Everybody got that? Dorothy, you got that in yours? Uh, in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 3, do you see the number 3 there? And then it's a little funny little mark before the word. Verse 3. In Jeremiah 4, verse 3. In the other Bible, but not in this Bible. Oh, you Bible guys do? It's whacked up. It's kind of... You got that little paragraph marker there? Is that what that is? Two lines. Yeah, two lines and a little thing up there? Yeah, she got... Okay, let me say this, Dorothy. What that does is that tells the reader that that's a new paragraph and, and most likely in the context of new thought. So that's, when you're studying the Bible for context, if you see one of those, start there. That'll give you some good context. You don't have it, Mother, because that Bible... And see, I've got to do that Bible. Yeah, because that Bible is not really conducive to study. Mm -hmm. Even little things like that. When I see those, I go there because it's... Now, my black thought. Bible is... Yeah. Okay, well, let's start in verse 3 then. Here we go. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. By the way, what fallow ground? Their own, in their heart. He's not just talking about the ground there. Because notice what he says in the next verse. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Lest my fury come forth like fire and burn, that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. I hope you guys can see that with God, the physical circumcision was important. But you know what was even more important? The spiritual circumcision of the heart. You see that? And here, because they're under the law, Jeremiah the weeping prophet says, You guys need to, hey, you guys need to humble yourself. Everything is about humility and listening to the Lord. That's what it's about. And you know what? They refused to do it, and God sent Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and, and destroyed them. And he was so gracious, everybody. Oh. He was so gracious that before he did it, he sent Jeremiah to warn him. And then he sent Nebuchadnezzar to the northern ten tribes called Israel. So he sends them to the northern ten tribes first. He says, I'm not going to let him touch J Judah, the southern territory, where the capital of Jerusalem, because for David's sake. He says, look, for King David's sake, for King David's sake, 
Nebuchadnezzar can't come there yet. And, and, and what he would tell them was like, hey, you guys down here, look at your brothers up there suffering under the king of Babylon. If you don't, you really call them your sisters, but if you, he says to Judah, Judah, look at your sister Israel. She's suffering, and the same fate is going to happen to you if you don't repent. And instead of saying, oh, Lord, stop and help us, they go, ah, we don't believe you. Do y'all know that they put Jeremiah, the prophet of God, People hate the prophet of God. You know that? No. They love the prophet of God when he's telling somebody else stuff. When, when Jeremiah talked talk to these heathens, Israel's like, yeah, tell them. When Jeremiah goes to you guys, they throw him in a, in a dungeon. They just throw him in, in the pit there because they didn't want to hear it. <laughs> Jeremiah had his scribe write the word of God down. The king has his man just tear the word and throw it into a fire. So God says, oh, you don't want my word? Okay, Jeremiah, come here. Write some. So he wrote the same thing and then added some more. Said, here's what this guy going to do for doing that. It, it's, it's, it's a prideful thing. Watch this. So God says, circumcise your heart. Now, that issue of where God will do it for them if, he, if, if they allow. Watch this. Here's the dynamic. And, and, and it's true today. This is an interdispensational principle. Okay. When he tells them, he says, circumcise your own selves. Here's what that looks like. How do you circumcise yourself? You humble yourself before God. And then, how does God, uh, now circumcised by God, chastens. Well, the chastening was, the, the, the pain was designed to humble you. Oh. But the chastening by God, the, the circumcised by God, is that he will give you power to serve him, okay? He's going to do it, to serve him. Okay. But God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. That's what Peter said. So this is what it is. Say, Lord, I, serve, I humble myself before you. God says, fine, now I'll give you the power to serve me. And if you don't humble yourself, you'll, he, won't, he won't allow you to, to be doing what he's doing. Go over to Jeremiah 31. Let me show you how he's going to do it. In Jeremiah 31, this is called the uh, excuse me. This is called the New Covenant. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. It's easy to remember. 31, 31. Watch this. Behold, <clears throat> the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a what? New covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. You see those two houses, Israel and Judah. Verse 32, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So it's not going to be like the old Mosaic covenant. What did they do with the old Mosaic covenant by the days of Jeremiah? Verse 32, which my covenant they break. Over in Hebrews, it's in Hebrews 8 verse 9 says they didn't continue in it. How do you break the covenant? You just stop listening to it. Although I was in husband unto them, saith the Lord. Dorothy, right before the study, you remember you were talking about the bride right. and so forth? Yes. And you were saying, yeah, it, it's associated with Israel, not the body. That's correct. Right. Israel and God were married together through that covenant. Notice, you see it says, although I was in husband unto them. Mm -hmm. That was a marriage covenant. And that's why God said they commit fornication or adultery and all that. Why, why use those words in relationship to their relationship with God? Because he married the nation, okay? Let's keep going. Verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Now, in verse 32, he says the house of Israel and the house of Judah. You got the ten northern and the two southern. But in the next verse, he doesn't say this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel and Judah. He says the house of Israel. So just like the prophets take the two sticks, excuse me, one and one, and he makes it, uh, oh yeah, to two sticks, one, one and one, and he makes them one again. He takes two and make it one. God's going to go back and take the two portions, Israel and Judah, and make one nation. The nation, oh, excuse me, the house of Israel. Now that's the new covenant? Yes. No longer will they be broken up for the pride of their power after, like they were in, after the days of Solomon. And when is that going to be? In the kingdom. Okay. Okay. 
Jesus Christ, our Lord, is going to do that when he returns in the kingdom. That's this. Look at verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, and those days are the days of the tribulation, saith the Lord, I will put my law, where? In their inward parts, and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. Everybody know, once again, God's going to now do it for them. Dorothy, what we have that Israel doesn't have is the Spirit of God living in us, right? The Jew could have the Spirit of God come upon them, and then it could leave them. We're special in the dispensation of grace because the Spirit of God is in us, in, inside us. Right. It won't be into the new covenant, into the kingdom where that actually happens for them. Watch this. Verse 33, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward part and write it in their hearts. And will be their God, and they shall be my people. What else? And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, and I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Now everybody knows this, I hope. Paul says in Romans 11, For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Romans 11, 27. Israel doesn't get their sins forgiven. They got remitted, but it can come back. But they get sins forgiven in the kingdom, the day of atonement. We get our sins forgiven, right, the moment we trust Christ. They don't get sins forgiven until they get into the kingdom. Until they accept the Messiah. Right. And, and, and not not that they even accept the Messiah, because like the, the little flock accepted the Messiah, right? Mm -hmm. But they could fall away. After our dispensation of grace, Dorothy, there are going to be some Jews who, who, by the way, by the way, all these little messianic congregations, I see them when I'm driving around, if the rapture happens today, they'll be the new little flock. Because they're Jewish people who believe Jesus is the Messiah. But what I'm saying is many of them are going to fall away. They're not a part of the body. They're not a part of the body, no, because they haven't gone as far enough to trust Paul's gospel. Unless they have some. Like well, there's some, some. Yeah, I'm, yeah again, <laughs> you can never say never. There could be some. But as a whole, they're not. many of them aren't trusting Paul's as gospel. A, as exactly. A exactly. Or just as a messian, these messianic Jews today. Yeah. But they will be the people of God after the rapture. But of those messianic congregations around the world, many of them are going to fall away towards the Antichrist. Because it's going to be so hard to live in that day. Oh, trust Paul's gospel. Now, okay, here we go. Now watch this. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, No, the Lord. Um, one of the things that the, the, the Jews will do after the rapture, the messianic Jews, i got to say that. Because there's Jews and then there's the messianic Jews, right. the kingdom saints at that time. Right. There's no kingdom saints today. They're Messianic Jews. But when the rapture happens, the ones who aren't in the body, but believe Jesus is their Messiah, they will now be the kingdom saints. If they continue on, endure to the end. That's the question. Right. Now, you see where it says, they shall teach no more every man his neighbor? Yes. I remember telling the brother, said, look, the Jews, the Messianic Jews, the kingdom saints after us, before the Lord returns, they're not going to be talking to Gentiles. They're going to be trying to convince other Jewish people to know the Lord, right? That's what they're going to be doing. They're going to be going to their neighbor Jew and saying, Hey, Jesus Christ is the Lord. But you know what's going to happen in the kingdom, Dorothy? In that kingdom, every Jew that survives and gets into the kingdom will know the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it says. Look at that. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. Right. For they shall what? All know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. Mm -hmm. for, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. So in that kingdom, he's going to do that. Uh, go with me if you will. Um, go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 37. Let me show you a beautiful thing about that as well. Look at Ezekiel chapter 37, if you will. Oh, I didn't notice where it was. I wasn't thinking about that. Remember earlier I mentioned the two sticks? Let me show you where I got that from. Look at Ezekiel chapter 37. 
Verse number uh, 19. Verse 18 where the, the paragraph. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Oh, no. I want to get the one where he tells him to pick up sticks. 17. Go, go back to 16. There you go. There you go. Look at 16. Moreover, thou son of man, take one stick and write upon it for who? Judah. And for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph and the stick of Ephraim, for all his, of all the house of Israel, his companions. So he got two sticks representing Israel and Judah. Verse 17. And join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thy hand. So I, I didn't know this. I forgot. This what, that's not where I, where I was going in this chapter. But all this stuff I was showing you about the two sticks becoming one, that's it. In the kingdom, that's going to happen. But let me show you what else. Look at Ezekiel 37. Uh, I always remember Kristen's telling me when she's back in Minnesota. Ezekiel 37 is a very uh, famous passage among religious people, athletes and stuff. Was it Chris Carter who told me he did that? He was, oh, he was yeah. talking. And he went there about, about, everybody wants to talk about the dry bones. Where, where, where it's like these dead bones and God tell, tells them to speak to it and the wind to blow on them and they become, they actually become people again. And everybody talks about the dry bones, right? Well, there's something more about Ezekiel 37 that, that, that is even greater for Israel. Let me show you this. Verse 24. For I will take you from among the heathen. So, so you know, Dorothy, now they're, now they're scattered. Yeah. When the Lord comes, he's going to bring them back. Watch this. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. And make no mistake about it, all the fighting in the Middle East is over that land. That's right. Now watch verse 25. Chris and I were joking about this. One of the first conversations we had way back when was about water baptism and stuff and another brother. But Chris was like, I didn't realize then, Ron, when you talk about something, you have verses all up in your head. Ten verses that nobody else is even thinking about. So we were talking about the way they were water baptized or cleansed was a sprinkling. Let me show you something. Verse number 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Now let me ask you, in, in the history of Israel, was there someone that God sent? Was it a man sent from God named John? Yes. And what was his job at the banks of the Jordan River? Baptizing. Baptizing the people of Israel. What he was doing, he was sprinkling them. Isaiah 52, 15 says, I will sprinkle many nations. When the Lord comes, that, that water baptism will, that was symbolic for Israel's cleansing is going to be actually among. By the way, then all the Gentiles will be, all. Oh, what is the Great Commission? Go into all the world, preach the gospel, every creature and so forth, baptizing them. How? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And when Israel does that to the nation, they're going to sprinkle them. Isaiah 52, 15. But look, look at this sprinkling. Look at verse 25. So, honey, these were the verses I had in my head. When Ken was trying to convince me. Up, oh, out of the water. Okay? All right, here we go. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you. Hey, we live in California. We in a drought. Pretty soon we're going to have to take our showers with a little sprinkling of water, right? We teach Jay to that. We, we, we teach Jay Lynn right now not to run the water. Conserve. We never had to do this in the Midwest. We had way too much water. Anyway, sprinkling. Verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Now here's what I want you to see about God circumcising their heart. A new heart will I give you. And a new what? Spirit will I put within you. See, that's when they're going to get the spirit of God in that kingdom. And I will take away the stony heart of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I, well, here it is, verse 27. I will put my spirit within you, and in that kingdom, everybody, notice what the spirit of God is going to do. He's going to write his law in the spirit and cause. See that word cause? God's going to cause them to be perfect and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Now, Go back to verse 26 for a minute. You see where he says in the middle of that verse, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh? Mm -hmm. In John chapter 11, this is when I knew, I, I knew, yeah, my destiny is to teach God's word. I remember being at this Grace Church, Brother Jordan's church, sitting around with some people, and we were talking about John chapter 11. 
And when, when Jesus told them, when Lazarus was in the tomb, he says, hey, remove the stone. And then it says about Jesus wept. And even amongst other dispensations, they were like, oh, he wept because Lazarus was, was, uh, was dead. Friend. Well, that, everybody said, but I go, no, because he knew he was going to raise him from the dead. In fact, he purposely didn't go so that Lazarus could die. Remember that? He was sick. Nigh unto death, and Jesus held back. And then, but, but when it said, the, the weeping part is this. When he says, remove that stone, because they kept telling him, Lord, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. Lord, oh, they weep. It says he looked upon everybody weeping and stuff like he wasn't there, right? If Jesus is in your presence, he is the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Instead of everybody weeping, when they saw him, they should have rejoiced, right? And when he looked around, and basically he was just like, man, they just don't get it. <laughs> he goes, remove the stone. And in my heart, it's this right here. It's like he's saying, remove that stony heart of, of unbelief. You know that? Mm -hmm. That was symbolic. Because that's what he was saying. Spiritually, he's going, remove the stone. Believe who I am. I am the resurrection and the life. So, so when he says, every time I read that, I think of John 11, verse 26. And I will take away the stony heart of your flesh. You know what that is? That's that pride and stiff-necked rebellion. Right. And I will give you a heart of flesh, soft. You know what a heart of flesh is? It's a soft heart. Fleshly, like that. Now, obviously, he's not talking about it in the negative. He's just talking about the softness of it. Amen. Krista has the softest flesh. I just like to hold it. When, when Jada Lynn was born... Krista would look at her, and she'd wash her and stuff in a little bath. It was kind of like little London. And she goes, I'm so jealous of her little soft flesh. <laughs> right? Remember that? Yeah. Day? You'd be bathing her, and she skin was just baby soft, like babies. Well, God wants that in our spirit. And that's what he's saying. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that for Israel, okay? Now, go with me, if you will, to John chapter 7. Go over to John chapter 7. Now we're working our way. Oh, I, did I tell you guys I'd show you Daniel? Um, let, let, me, let me find uh, this passage in Daniel. Give me one second. Yeah, go to Daniel chapter 9. You remember, Dorothy, you said that God put them out there, right? Yes. Well, you didn't say you noticed what the scriptures say, right? Okay. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Daniel recognized that very fact. Daniel knew that the reason why he and those boys... Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, all those princes of Judah, all those no, no, young noble men 70 years ago is because the people of Israel rebelled against God and Nebuchadnezzar was the rod of God's indignation and took them captive. <laughs> destroyed the temple. <coughs> By the way, anytime the temple is destroyed, it's to Israel saying, God's not with you. And when Abraham, oh, excuse me, when, when, when Nebuchadnezzar did it and when Titus, the Roman uh, general, uh, general in 70 AD that was a picture to Israel that God's not with you. The priest Dorothy 40 years earlier saw they went into the temple and they saw the, 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 the curtain. Remember we were talking about the veil that curtain rent from the top down? I, I think it was like 50 or 60 feet tall. No man could do it. The point is the priest should have said where's God? And it took 40 years for Israel to say where's God? Because our temple is destroyed by the Romans. Now watch this. Daniel is here. Let's go to chapter 9, verse 1. And in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by what? The books. Can I just stop to say this? If you're going to understand God, you got to get in the books. And if you're going to understand God, what he's doing today, which books do you have to study? Oh, you have to study Paul's books. Because Paul will tell you, consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. That's a verse in 2 Timothy 2. And if you were a Jew in captivity, you would read the books of the law and so forth, but there was a particular book you needed to get in. A man named Jeremiah was going to explain to you what God's doing. Let's keep looking at it. Look at chapter 9, verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books. Oh, that's so important, guys. you got to get in the book. The number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to who? Jeremiah the prophet, 
that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Daniel believed God's word through Jeremiah that 70 years you would be in captivity. And you know what? Daniel's looking around going, been about 70 years I've been here. When are we going to get back to Jerusalem? And he starts to pray. Now, we got, we got to end soon, but notice the prayer. I want you guys to see how Daniel, he doesn't blame God. Never blame. He says, you know what, God? You were righteous. We were wrong. You're right. I'm wrong. You're right. We're wrong. Here we go. Verse number three. And I set my face unto the Lord God and to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And by the way, guys, fasting, sackcloth, ashes to the Jews. That was a sign of humility. OK. Verse number four. And I prayed unto the Lord, my God, and made. Oh, I made my confession. Daniel was probably the most righteous man on earth at that time. And he said, Lord, I'm confessing. Watch what he says. And said, oh, Lord, the great and dreadful God. That word dreadful means he feared God. <laughs> he goes, I fear you, God. The great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Now, notice the first word of verse 5. What's that first word? We. we. He says, we as a nation, we have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have what? Oh, that's the word. That's the word. Man, I'm that word, rebellion, that's the thing God hates the most. Krista noticed something. We, we noticed something moving in California. California has some of the most rebellious hearted people. A spirit of rebellion. Not, not, not you, not you. Though, you know. We're talking about these lost people. There's this spirit of this rebel against authority, rebel against God. It's just it's this rebellion, rebellion, rebellion culture. And maybe people who've been here a long time can see, but when you come into this place, right, it's just yeah. the spirit of like. about the laws. That's why they had a um, red light fan for $400. I've never seen or heard of that yeah, before in Illinois, yeah. Minnesota. Yeah, well, I know, but don't even get me started on that. Hold on, Hold on. We've been, I'm going to finish this up, but we'll, we'll talk about that before we leave, because that's a good point. Uh, but... Well, that same rebellious spirit it does is, is not just in our culture, it was in Israel's culture. And notice this. Notice that when Daniel is praying to God, notice in verse 5, we have sinned and committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even, and here's what rebellion ultimately is, mm -hmm. even by departing from thy precepts and thy, the people hate the word of God. Amen. Verse 6, neither have we hearkened unto thy servants the prophets. Yeah, yeah you killed them which spake in thy name to our kings and our princes and our fathers and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces, as at this day to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and unto all Israel that are near and that are far off, through all the countries with whether thou hast driven them because of their trespass and because they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face, to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers. Man, Daniel is a very thorough Bible student, because we have sinned against thee, to the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have, what's our word? We rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he has set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yea, all Israel. Now, we have to end, but notice, everybody notice, particularly verse 12. I'm going to read 11, but watch verse 12. Yea, all Israel has transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us. So why did God put the curse of the captivity on them? Because they did not obey his voice. And the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. Now, watch this, Dorothy. And he hath confirmed his words. What verse are you at? Verse 12. <laughs> See where it says, and he hath confirmed his words? I turned the page. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. He hath confirmed his words. So the, the covenant says, if you rebel against me, I'm going to put you under captivity. Daniel's like, we're under captivity. Thanks. You confirmed your words. Yeah. Go down to verse 14. Right. Therefore the Lord watched upon the evil. Oh, my. Everybody understand. When he says, therefore the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all his works, which he doeth, for we obeyed his not his voice. 
Man. Can I just say what he's saying? He's righteous. He's going, he says, Lord, you're so righteous, whether it's blessing or cursing, you're going to make sure it happens. I got to end this, but God, over in Isaiah, says, I do a strange work. Chris and I, we've been in ministry a long time together, and one of the things that we have to deal with is things that happened, you know, recently. And it hurts our heart because it's like, we just want the, we just want things to, I know it is, well, our offense is going to come, we just want things to flow, just flow righteously, just let's have a ministry, let's love one another. And, and, and it's hard to deal with these things, but this is, in the last days, satanic policy of evil to destroy our, our ministry. That's what the Lord said. He said, I hate it to put you in captivity. I love you guys, but I must keep my word. I must keep order. And if you guys made a covenant that if you disobey, I have to... And that's what he's saying. You watched and did the evil. You brought it upon us, Lord. You scattered us because it was the right... That's what he's saying. It's the right thing to do. God is so righteous, he keeps his word. That's what he's saying. Whether it's for good or evil. And so that's important to know as we look at this. Now... We'll, we'll end in John chapter 7. We'll pick up in Romans next week. Look at John chapter 7. Just uh, the last uh, verse in the prophetic program that we're going to look at. Then we'll look at what Paul says about circumcision in his epistles. Look at John chapter uh, 7. Let's end there. We'll go a little bit over tonight since we're not going to have a, a long few minutes. Look at John chapter 7. Now watch this. Start at verse 19. The Lord is speaking. Did not Moses give you the law? <laughs> I watch this. And yet, none of you keepeth the law? Why do you go about to kill me? They wanted to kill the Lord Jesus because he wanted to heal people. On the Sabbath. Watch what he says. I, there's a Jewish man. It's the Sabbath. I want to heal him. That's the covenant. I'm gonna, the covenant says the Messiah is going to heal you. God told him. So it's the Sabbath. The religious leaders say, it's the Sabbath. You can't heal him. The Lord said, wait a minute. If one of your, if one of your animals fall into a ditch on the Sabbath, all you guys will get a rope and pull them out. And watch what else they did on the Sabbath. That has nothing to do with anything about healing a human being. Watch this. Let's end in this passage. Verse 19, I love this. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth it? I mean, he basically told them, you religious shysters, none of y'all keep the law. That's what he's saying. You guys want to go about and kill me. The worst sin under the law outside of blasphemy of God is kill a man. Verse 20. The people answered and said, thou hast a devil. Who goes about to kill thee? By the way, they were conspiring behind the scenes to kill him the whole time. Right. They, come out, they just came out of a meeting and said, we're going to kill him. Deceit. Yeah, and he, he goes, y'all trying to kill him. We ain't trying to kill him. They just had a meeting. We're going to kill Jesus. In fact, it's called the, the, kill, the kill Jesus meeting, right? The meeting to kill Jesus. And they said, we didn't try. Okay, let's keep going. Verse 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and ye are a marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. In other words, it didn't begin with Moses. It began back with Father Abraham. And ye on the Sabbath day. Now watch this. What do they do on the Sabbath day? Circumcise. They circumcise. So let's say a, a Jewish woman had a son. If that eighth day of that boy's life, physical life outside the womb, fell on the Sabbath, guess what they did? They circumcised. The Lord says, if y'all do that for a little boy, I can't go to a grown man on the Sabbath and heal the man? Are you guys crazy? He's just trying to show them the insanity of their thinking. Verse 23. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, you know, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole? In other words, I healed a man on the Sabbath day? And here's the, here's the point. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge what? Righteous judgment. He goes, every Sabbath, some little boy in Israel is being circumcised, and you guys celebrate it. They have a party for him. <laughs> the Lord is looking like, okay, you guys are breaking the Sabbath every day. That a boy has to be circumcised on that eighth day, if it falls on a Sabbath. 
Here I am. There's a man sick, about to die. I heal him, send him back to his family, and they rejoice. And they mad. They want to kill Jesus for doing that. He goes. And they accused him of being of the devil. Yeah. But they were so insane, Dorothy, in their thing. They were so blind because of unbelief that they couldn't see that they do this all the time. And in another place, he wasn't here. He says, if, if your ox falls in a hole on the Sabbath, you and a group of dudes grab some, some ropes and pull them out. An ox. That's labor. Yes. And he said, I'm healing people. This man's about to die. I mean, that, that is the insanity of people. The Lord is like, I'm healing people. You guys pulling oxes out, but y'all mad at me. Does, does God take care of oxes? First Corinthians 9, Paul said, no. He cares about, God loves people. Okay, anyway. If you're out there listening, maybe you enjoyed the study, you learned some things about circumcision, but really there's a circumcision of the heart that God will do for you. If you humble yourself and believe that Christ died for your sins, that you can't get to God on your own merit, your own works, Paul, our apostle, says that God will give you everlasting life as a free gift. And when you trust Jesus Christ, we're going to learn next week, so look at the next study, that God does a circumcision on your heart. What he will do for Israel in the kingdom, he has done for you and me in Christ. So you can learn more about that. But that's just your position. Then God will daily circumcise your heart giving you a soft heart of flesh and taking away that stony heart of unbelief will help you with that too as you grow in the process of edification and sanctification. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the time. Uh, the time to me seemed to just fly by this, this night. Uh, look up and we're at 66 minutes. So Father, we're going to stop. But right now, we just give you thanks and praise to get into your word, both uh, uh, the, the epistles of our Apostle Paul um, we get into the Old Testament and into the prophetic scriptures as well to learn and to see new things and, and, and to be reminded of old things. Thank you for your word, Father. This is the most precious thing on planet Earth is your holy scripture. And, and the second most precious thing is a human being who chooses to put those holy scriptures into their heart. So thank you for the word of God and thank you for people who love the word. May we have more and more hearts desiring the truth of your word. So, Father, um, we just thank you for our time together tonight. As we have our uh, short Q&A, we'll give you thanks and praise in Christ's name. Amen.